appreciate you inviting me to come, and what a fantastic school we've had the opportunity to, to visit this afternoon. So I'm Trey Hargan. I'm Tennessee's Secretary of State. I'm elected by the legislature, so nobody in here has ever voted for me except for Todd Gardenhire. So the members of the House and the Senate come together to elect me every four years. Um, if you were trying to figure out where that stands in state government, there's a governor, there's a lieutenant governor, there's a speaker of the House, and then there's me. Now that sounds really impressive. Anybody ever watch the Olympics? Where's first place get? Second? Third? Fourth? There you go. So it sounds really impressive, but I'm not on the medal stand with everybody else, all right? So it's a really busy time for us, and actually we're in Southeast Tennessee. Tomorrow morning, I'm gonna be visiting, and actually all day and the rest of the week, visiting election commissions as early voting starts. And we, Todd changed the law this year, along with he and his colleagues in the Senate and the House, to make it where people as young as 16 years of age could serve as poll workers. So if you're interested in, in trying to work the polls and make a little extra money and, and try to learn a bit more about the election and the civics process, you can contact the Bradley County Election Commission and ask if they still need any workers. And um, it's a great way to make a little money. I think it's about somewhere between 10 and $12 an hour to work all day. It's, a, it's really fun. You get to meet all kinds of interesting people. And I just think it's really important, especially for people your age, to begin building that habit to be involved in the community around you, learn the voting process, and because I believe that our, our society functions best when we all engage in the process, regardless of what our ideology is, you know, what we're Republican or Democrat, we all are better together whenever we try to learn how to disagree without being disagreeable, and we can go to the polls and cast our vote based on our belief system, at the same time listening to others and realizing that we have the greatest state and the greatest nation in the world that has, has a smooth transition of power and we do things in orderly fashion and a part of that is because that we get the opportunity to vote in those elections. So I'm just delighted to spend a few minutes with you today. I know Senator Gardenhire likes a few things and we would love to try and answer some questions if that's okay. Senator? Yep, I'm, I just had to look up here. I've, I've met from here on down all of these guys. I used to work for President Reagan and uh, did it for six years in Mrs. Reagan, so uh, had the opportunity to meet each one of them personally. Uh, it's a real, real, real pleasure to do that. I got elected eight years ago. Uh, what do we do in the Senate? There's 33 of us, uh, what, 6.8 6 million people? Six, and there's 99 House members, so there's three of these guys for every one of our, us. In the Senate, we, we all get along. The, 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 the fight in the, in the Senate is never between a Republican and Democrat, black or white. It's always rural versus urban. That's where the fight is. And all the rural counties stick together and all the urban counties stick together. Bradley County is in the middle, as you can probably figure out. So uh, we try to come up and fix problems that we see in the state if we see something needs to be done. We do it, like help funding the Pi Center that y'all have here, help funding the mechatronics lab that we just left with one of the bills that I sponsored, uh, teamed up with five community colleges and, and the schools in their, in their area to do that. Uh, that's just an example of what we do. Uh, but it all costs money. And our job, we only have, when you get right down to it, in the legislature, in the state of Tennessee, we only have one, one vote that we need to make, and that's to balance the state budget. That's the only requirement that we have. Everything else falls underneath that, so we have to prioritize how we're gonna spend our money versus how much money comes in from taxes and fees and those types of things. So as we try to figure out what to do, we have to look over here on this side, and I'm on the finance committee, I'm on the Pension and Insurance Committee, and I'm the Vice Chairman of what's called the Physical Review Committee. So we have to look at everything that we spend to make sure it fits with everything that we want to spend. And trust me, there is more demand for what we want to spend than what we can spend. And that's where the rub comes in. That's where the hard decisions are made. Who do you tell no to? And who do you say yes to? And it is a recurring figure or a non-recurring. Let me explain what that means. 
if the pie center says we need a million dollars to help purchase land and equipment and everything else, that is a non-recurring one-year expenditure the state would do. If it's a recurring expense, like the mechatronics money, that means it goes on year after year after year after year. So you obviously build in a base budget. Transportation is a recurring item. Healthcare is a recurring item. Education is a recurring item. So when you get all the recurring items, add it all together, then and only then can you look at the non-recurring items. And that's what you can spend if you've got the money. Just like your house, your home. If, you, if your family doesn't have the money, you can't go spend a lot of money on over here. So that's what we do. That's in a nutshell what a legislator does is we decide to figure out how do we spend the money versus what we have. Somebody? Thank you, sir. Senator, could you explain to them in the state of Tennessee that uh, legislatively we have to have a balanced budget? That that's one of the reasons that uh, that your job is so important is that we have it is legislated to have a balanced budget. So there's no credit opportunities. There's none yeah. of that mess. It, in our constitution, in the state constitution, it's required that we balance the budget. We cannot play games as the federal government does. We can't print money. We have to actually have the revenue in hand before we can spend the money. So we're required, that's like I said, we only have one required vote and that's to balance the budget because that's our constitutional duty to do it. Thank you. Okay, if you have any questions, it can be about budgeting or general jobs of the legislature or it could be about the election process um, related to any of your questions or about why they changed the law about poll pages. <laughs> Somebody? <laughs> History class? <laughs> Alright, let me ask a question. How many of you like politics? A few of you raise your hands. Okay, the rest of you, you know, you're not sure. Some of you know you don't like politics. So, <laughs> I, I'm kind of curious. So, where do people get their news now? How many of you get it from TV? A few people raise their hands. How many of you get it from Twitter? Or Instagram? Or Facebook? So, you know, get it from social media? Anybody still read the newspaper? Not, not many people, even online, not many people anymore. So um, that's one of the real challenges now is where do people get their information from? Now, has anybody heard the phrase foreign interference in recent years? Okay. So there's been a lot of conversation about foreign interference in elections. And, and frankly, it's not just a foreign interference. It's also there are people domestically who would love to try and create discord and disunity in our country. And, and they will put out messages to try and pit people, whether it's Republicans versus Democrats, left versus right, um, urban versus rural or suburban, and all those things. And I just want to caution you, one of the things we're really having to focus on is the social media aspect of it. Is that there's all kinds of trolls, y'all know what that term is, don't you? There's all <laughs> kinds of trolls out there who put out these messages that we're having to always fight against in our department. Like, there will be people during this election cycle who will put out messages about polling places being closed, or polling place opening late, or closing early, or long lines. And if you put out a message saying that the polling place has a long line, the first thing you're thinking about is, well, gosh, I don't want to go wait that line. I'm just going to have to go later. And then you may never go later. And so they do some of those things to try and discourage people from voting. And they also do some of those things to try and agitate between two different groups of people. And so as you collect information, not just in the world of politics, but whatever you choose to do, Get it from good, trusted sources of information. Uh, I use this joke a lot, and I tell people, don't get your news or your information from someone who has a kitten for a profile pic and 79 followers. If any of you have a kitten for a profile pic, I'm not trying to insult you. <laughs> but there's a lot of people out there that you know will say these, these outlandish things, and I look, and I'm like, who in the world is that? And I look, and they've got a picture of, of something, and I'm like, what is that? I, I don't know who that is and what that is. And so a lot of people aren't even real. You know, they are put out there just trying to be able to put out false information. So we're having to fight against that in the state of Tennessee and nationally. Um, and I mentioned earlier, you know, there are foreign, foreign governments out there that are trying to take us down. And there are people inside this country who, who love to see us fight one another. And the real key for us is how to learn 
to disagree without being disagreeable, to try and get good information to base our decisions on, and, and, and do it with people you trust and institutions you trust. You know, if you're trying to get information about where to go to college, you probably ought to go and talk to that college or that, you know, guidance counselor here at the school or somewhere, at, you know, somewhere here, somebody you know and trust. Don't go to somebody you've never met before, find them on Instagram or Twitter and figure out what they think about it. Use trusted sources, and we're trying to get people to do that when they make decisions about who they ought to vote for. And, and now more than ever with the advent of social media and the explosion and how rapidly news occurs, it's that much more important that we go to trusted, trusted sources to get information in all areas of our lives. So just thought I would throw that in. And also want to encourage you, since you're not going to ask questions, I'm going to get on my soapbox for a minute. <laughs> I think probably a couple of them do have questions. Like, I know Hayes is probably asking. Give me two <laughs> minutes. <laughs> How many of you are on social media? <laughs> Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Tinder. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Don't raise your hand on that one. <laughs> I, yeah, exactly. I always try and catch people. I never catch anybody, thank goodness. So, um, but so probably in your generation, I have a senior at home. He's on Snapchat. That's what a lot of y'all are on. Um, Use that wisely. I, I want you to think about your age, and I know it's kind of hard to believe, you are right now already developing your brand of who you are and what you stand for and what message you send to others out there in, in the, the um, ecosphere of social media. And, and just think about the message you're trying to send. And um, if the message you're trying to send is how late you can stay up and how bad your hair can look at 10 o'clock in the morning because you laid, you laid in bed all morning, um, knock yourself out. But if you want to also develop the brand of being someone who's very conscientious and caring for others and hardworking, it's an opportunity to do that as well. So, so think about the brand you're trying to build and what message you're trying to communicate whenever you post something, whether it's a picture or, or text. Okay, so just think about those things. Because also, some people think they have their social media locked down um, the, and say, well, only my friends can follow me. Yeah, but all it takes is one of those friends. And believe me, I've got 14,000 followers, but I don't have 14,000 friends. All right? <laughs> Um, all it takes is one person to screenshot what you thought was just in a small group of people and you can send it out everywhere. So be very thoughtful and conscientious about how you use social media. So thanks for letting me do that 90 second Absolutely. commercial there. Let, let me add to that just real quick. My youngest son is, is in the last stages of a job interview that he's going through and he has to have a, a government clearance, security clearance. And 10 years ago I told him, I said, now, be careful what you put on Facebook. It may sound cool, it may look cool at the time and all your friends, but at some point, some employer, and he was in college at the time, some employer is gonna go back and look at all your Facebook posts for the last 10 years and see if you're really the type of person they wanna hire or not. And luckily, he didn't put anything on that he'd be embarrassed about. So, you know, it, it like, like Secretary Hart said, you know, it's, it's, it may look cool, it may look funny, it may be only for a few friends, but it goes everywhere and it's always there. It never, you can hit the delete button as many times as you want to, but these corporations have a way to pull it all back up. It can be funny for a minute and sad for a lifetime. Yeah. All right. Somebody had questions? Hey, Sue, you got one? Somebody. So I was going to ask, like, how do you guys like deal with outlandish claims that some people may put out on the internet? Um, great question. We always try to figure out, number one, who, who what's the source? Is it coming from someone who's genuinely interested in trying to find out the, the truth about something? And if it is, I try to answer those. Um, then there's some people who are doing it just to try and be provocative. I ignore those, and that's hard. As recently as today, <laughs> or this morning, you know, I, I'm having to look at that. And I honestly, I stay off of our Twitter account by and large just because it's the toxic dump, okay? And, and the good news is, is you're never as bad as Twitter says you are. The sad news is you're never as good as Twitter says you are either. The truth is somewhere in the middle of all that. And, uh, and just recognizing that some people really are not interested in engaging in a conversation and, uh, and, and trying to figure out who's a real person and who's not. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. You have to have real thick skin. To uh, survive the criticism that comes, you just have to, to some extent, ignore it and let, let it pass. Do you know? Uh, yeah. Um, so yesterday we talked about how, uh, like, during the voting, you can have like voting fraud by voting in two different states. 
and like with registration. So how often do you guys uh, update that registration for like voting? So we're updating our vote registration really about on a quarterly basis. But by the same token, if we find out in Bradley County that, that someone passed away, you take that person off the voter rolls. If you find out they moved away and you got proof of that, you take those people off the voter rolls. Communi uh, states communicate with one another and counties communicate with one another when a voter comes off of their rolls in one county or goes onto a rolls in another county, they notify the former county so you don't have that, that duplicate, that person that rolls twice. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Good question. Now that's what Tennessee does. Yeah. We can't. We don't know it. In some other states, I don't know how regularly they do it. Um, you know, I don't know. Yes, sir. So excluding like you may have lived here, this being your hometown in Tennessee, like why would you choose to serve here rather than another state? Why would I choose to serve here? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, this is where I live. This, I think it's the greatest state, the greatest country in the world. So uh, we have a, a fantastic economy here. We have a responsible government that believes in low taxes and low debt. Uh, we're investing more in K-12 education, higher education than ever, and as someone who has two children, you know, I want them to have good economic opportunity as well as good education. It's a great state to raise your children in where they can get a good education, K-12 and higher ed, have a career here, and retire here. So it's in all four stages of my life. We've spent a lot of time in this class kind of talking about their next steps. So you mentioned you worked for President Reagan for a while. Would you talk a little bit about what you did in that and then also just kind of what your career has looked like? Talk about your time with President Reagan's staff and oh. then kind of what your, your career trajectory has been yeah. to now. Okay, well, when I graduated from University of Tennessee at Chattanooga with a business degree, I went to work in the financial industry at a bank. Three years later, I went with a major investment firm and stayed in that industry for 40 years. I retired four and a half years ago from Morgan Stanley. Uh, uh, background it was uh, uh, very blue collar uh, my dad family all worked at Southern Railway I worked there while I was going to school uh, but during that course of all that I, I was I've always been interested in the political process and uh, back in the 80s 70s I was a delegate for President Reagan in 1976 co-state chairman for his campaign and then in 80 I was elected as a delegate again and in 84 again, and then uh, got a call from the White House, asked if I wanted to do some work for the president, and I said, sure, and uh, became an advanced man for President Reagan. And, uh, Tell me what an advanced man means. Okay, an advanced man is, uh, let's say the president was going to come to Bradley County, and he was going to go visit the Pi Center. Then I would go in two weeks ahead of time without anybody really knowing about it, and go in with a Secret Service agent, and we would design what the president was going to do while he was at the Pi Center, how they get from the airport to Cleveland, how they get to where they're going, how the motor, who's in the motorcade, who greets the president, all the mechanics and logistics of a visit, what the backdrop is, uh, where the sound is, who, who, what media is, is, is included, if there's a pool, all those logistical things you design to do and you develop a schedule uh, that the president goes by and, and all the staff members. If it's an overnight trip, then you have to secure rooms for basically 300 people. That's how many people follow a president from place to place. Uh, we went to Little Rock, Arkansas in November of 84 and took every single hotel room in the town to house everybody. Uh, when we went to uh, uh, went to London with Mrs. Reagan for the royal wedding in 86, I think it was, Fergie's wedding. Uh, we just wiped out all the uh, hotel rooms there because the world press was coming in for this. We had to design all that logistics for it. Uh, same thing uh, if, you, if you go to any town. You used to literally set up the trip. So when the president walks through that door, it looks easy. He walks up here to the front and he gives a speech. He talks to you, uh, answers questions, and leaves. But it's getting him in and out the door, into the car, into the motorcade, turned around, the driver's for it, all clear through Social Security, through the highway, highway patrol does it all, take it down to the airport, greet people at the airport, get on a plane, plane takes off. That's your, your logistical person. 
Okay. We, do, we do nothing with security, not a thing. That's a whole different ballgame. Uh, just, just do all the, the, the ground logistics. When you're working for the president or first lady, the first rule is don't make a mistake. If you make a mistake, you make the president look bad. If you make the president look bad, it's the last trip you'll do. So the pressure is enormous to make sure it's all done in perfection. Senator, did you grow up from a family that had a lot of money? No. I work, we all worked at the railroad. Yeah. I didn't grow up that way. I think one of the things a lot of people think about, especially your age, is that I've got to have a lot of money if I ever want to serve in government or be in politics. And that's not, not true. But I tell you what, there's no substitute for, in my opinion, is hard work, it is having a good, strong work ethic. And, and some of the, the people that I mentor myself after, as I was your age, a little bit older in college, is I go work on their campaigns, and I know you did the same thing too. And I went out and knocked on doors and just developed a, a great re reputation for being a hard worker. And, and so um, you have an opportunity to do that now. You know, if you're interested in politics, get involved in campaigns and, and develop a track record of accomplishment and success. Um, it's not all about money. Could, could you guys talk about um, why it's important to not only register to vote, but to vote? Mm -hmm. I hear a lot of younger people saying, well, I can't change anything. And that always disturbed me. So I wanted you guys to talk about the value of the vote. Well, in my first race that I ran, there was 16,500 votes cast in the primary. On election night, I won by 15 votes. <laughs> 15 votes. But in respect of 160 votes, would be 1%. So 16 votes would be 0.1%. Yeah. That's all I won by. Now, the next day, the, uh, the person that lost asked for a challenge to recount the vote. I'm sitting there laying in bed the next morning, and a phone rings from the election commissioner, and he says, we found 25 more votes, and hung up. <laughs> you know, I didn't know if I lost my 10 votes or won my 40 votes. And I couldn't get him back on the phone. <laughs> I had to get ready to drive the election commission to say, who got the other 25 votes? Well, I got them. But you say, your vote doesn't count? Well. I mean, this class could have changed that whole, mm -hmm. that whole election. And play that further down, you might not have a mechatronics lab today yes. if the people hadn't voted in that election elected him. And that's something that gets his opponent. Um, he might have had different priorities and pursued something else totally different and not placed an emphasis on it. And what you have down here might be at some other school across the state, somewhere else, if that happened at all. So the one thing is for sure, if you don't vote, your vote will never matter. Okay, so you're better off being an educated consumer with your vote, determining what your values are and voting your values. And I can't promise you that your vote is what's going to be the difference maker of who the next state senator is, state representative, U.S. senator, even the president of the United States. But what I can to tell you, what I can tell you is that when you don't vote, all you do is hand the reins of power over to those people that do. If you think you're better off doing that, go ahead, make me more powerful, because I'm going to go vote. All right. So I encourage you when you get the opportunity to register to vote and to vote in the, the elections. Now, now keep in mind, we had a special election down in Chattanooga, and the person that won, well, let me say it this way, the person that lost had a bunch of old folks working in his campaign. The person that won the race had all high school people out at the polls going door to door, and you say, okay, what's the difference? The difference is, is every time you get involved in something, you can bet your parents are going to say, God, he's, he's, I've got to help him. He's really interested. I'm gonna, who do you want me to vote for? You want uh, Joe Blow? Great. Because my son was involved. So you have a multiplier effect of the system. So trust me, your vote counts and your activity counts whether you think it does or not. Can I ask it? question following up something. We've had a discussion in this class about whether politicians make decisions as a trustee of the people with what you believe to be the best interest or whether as more of a just microphone or megaphone voicing what the people think. So does that make sense? Kind of we've talked about that contrast. Between the answer is yes. 
I was going to ask how you find the balance, how either of you find the balance. It's hard to find that balance, I mean, because they're, they're made, I think as an elected official, you really have an obligation to speak the truth. Sure. And, and to go back to your constituents and say, if, who, if you're finding your constituents are disagreeing that you're not in, in sync with them, you really have an obligation to go back and say, hey, I, I really disagree, and, and here's, and try and help people understand why you are where you are. And I would tell you, I think most voters out there, when even there was a disagreement between them and their elected official, as long as they believe their elected official is honest in making sincere and well-intentioned decisions, that covers up for a lot of things. I think it's whenever elected officials take an air that I know better than you, yes. and, and I'm sorry you're not as smart as me, whenever they take that air, that's where they get in trouble. So, um, you know, we're fortunate we've got a lot of wonderful people on both sides of the aisle here in Tennessee who take the more thoughtful approach about communicating with their, their constituents. Let me tell you, I'll make one, one absolutely solid statement to you. Every legislator up there in Nashville votes their district first. Let me reemphasize that. We vote our district first. Now, some may have an extremely wealthy community. They're going to vote that district the way the interest of that is. Some that have, a, a, I, have I have, by the way, the 10th district of the state of Tennessee is the most diverse district in the state. I've got Lookout Mountain, which is one of the wealthiest communities in the, in the southeast. I've got Alton Park in East Chattanooga, which is all African American and probably one of the poorest sections in the state. I've got East Ridge, which is blue collar. I've got Appleton and Brad I donut around Cleveland with, Apple, with, with uh, Bradley County, which is a lot of rural and farm. I got Farm Bureau farmers uh, and those. So I've got I've got I've got the mixture of every type of constituent. You can believe I'm going to be thinking in my mind, what what does this bill have to do with my constituent base before I listen to anybody else? And so that's that's where most I give give an example. And, and by the way, not everybody gets elected is very smart, okay? Don't ever. <laughs> Logic has nothing to do with a lot of things that happen. I, I'm on pension and insurance as I mentioned before. There was a bill that came up, a well meaning bill. Does anybody in here have any family members that have diabetes? You do. Okay. You know, they've got to take insulin shots if they're di uh, level one diabetic. Insulin is extremely expensive shot to say like $175, $200 a shot to take. It, and most insurance companies don't want to cover it. So a legislator, a, a very solid legislator, brought a bill that said, we're going to put a cap in Tennessee on the price of insulins. Nobody can charge more than $100 for an insulin shot. Yeah, that's great. When I think about economics 101, you're a company that makes insulin, okay? You can sell it in Georgia for $175, or you can sell it in Tennessee for $100. Where are you going to sell it? You're going to sell it in Georgia. How many people in Tennessee will get their $100 insulin? Zero. Now, we had a discussion in our pension insurance business and everybody said, oh gosh, we got to vote for it. We're going to put a cap on insulin at $100. And this one legislator from, I won't mention where he's from, but he said, uh, oh, how can you vote against insulin? That's going to look bad. And I said, buddy, if you've got to worry it looks bad, you're in the wrong business. And, and then when I went through this whole economic 101 on something, you know, then the light kind of came on. So you, you, you have to get a great understanding of basic economics. People ask all the time, what should I take to be in politics? Political science? I say no. Take economics. Business and economics, because everything drives around one thing when you get up there. The dollar. And the cost of what it costs to do it. So if you don't understand basic 101 economics, then you're going to miss a lot of things that you really need to, to take a look at. That's the best advice I can give anybody that's looking at any type of service in the community. Well, you mentioned East Ridge. We've got to get to East Ridge. We're going to run behind. So, yep. guys, thanks for your time and courtesy. I wish you well. I hope some of you consider working with polls. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. So, you said, you asked them where they, where they received their information. 
Can you tell them what would be the best way about getting uh, political candidate information? Because if they vote, then they need to vote informed. So go to the source. Go to, go to, go to the campaign website themselves and find contact information. And, and, and don't hesitate to contact that campaign, that candidate, and say, tell me why I should vote for you. And, and see what they say. If they don't say, they don't ask your questions or give you a good reason, ask them the question, tell them what's important to you, see what they say back. Don't be afraid to contact somebody and figure that out. What's the colors of y'all's school? Blue and gold. What colors do I have on? Blue and gold. Did I vote my constituency? <laughs> Uh, I would say one thing to all of you is that if you reach out to your legislature,